Welcome to Electrified. It's your host, Dylan Loomis. Quick shout out to my newest patron, Matt Z. Thank you for choosing to support the channel. Let's talk about this chatter about these breakthroughs in battery technology coming out of China. First up, we have CATL saying that by the end of this year, their Naxtra, which is basically going to be their brand for sodium ion battery packs, should enter production with up to 310 miles of range. Their CTO said, we have achieved a breakthrough not only in terms of energy storage density and cost, but also found a new key to environmental protection. And yes, 99 out of 100 battery breakthroughs are typically more marketing than anything else, but if sodium ion were to carve out a role in the EV industry, that would be a huge deal because they do not use lithium and that would pave a way for many companies to decouple from China because remember, they basically control the lithium supply chain. They touted energy storage density of 175 watt hours per kilogram compared to 185 watt hours per kilogram for LFP cells. We still have two huge questions on this technology though because CATL did not say the expected cost for these cells nor what their manufacturing capacity would be. As a reminder, CATL CEO had said before that sodium ion batteries could potentially replace up to half of the global market for LFP cells. Not only this, but CATL is saying they have upgraded battery cells that can charge faster than BYD and get up to 520 kilometers of range, which is about 320 miles in just five minutes. This is not sodium ion. It's a new version of its flagship cell, which has the name Shenjing. Of course, the question becomes if it can recover 320 miles of range in five minutes. What is the max capacity for range going to be? They're saying the second generation of the Shenjing battery gets up to 800 kilometers on one charge, which is about 497 miles. And CATL CEO said the new Shenjing battery would be installed in more than 67 EV models this year. And back to the Naxtra sodium ion tech, they're saying that should have a range of up to 500 kilometers, which is 300 111 miles for a full BEV, and the new sodium cells should enable up to about 124 miles for a hybrid or about 200 kilometers. It's been a while since we've touched on sodium batteries, but just remember sodium is abundant and widely available, which should make them cheaper to produce. Sodium can be sourced from seawater, they're supposed to be safer and less prone to thermal runaway, meaning battery fires should be less likely. They've been touted to have better performance in cold Older climates. They should be easier to recycle. They don't need any cobalt. But again, the major trade-off has been lower energy density compared to LFP and definitely NMC type cells. A quick aside on this topic, there was actually a promising United States company, Bedrock Materials, that was founded by an ex-Tesla engineer. But as you can see, just this week, Bedrock has made the decision to get out of business. And in doing so, they're returning most of the venture capital that it raised. At least part of the reason its founder decided to shut down is because when this company was founded in 2023, lithium prices were sky high and since then they've come down dramatically meaning any cost benefit from using sodium ion batteries was not nearly as profound. And Bedrock's founder said that given the change in lithium prices, he expected LFP prices to remain cheaper than sodium ion through the mid 2030s. He also said, we think the chemistry is similar enough between the two platforms that improving LFP is the easier pathway forward. There are a handful of vehicles in China with shorter ranges, typically under 175 miles that are already using sodium ion batteries and they're in production. At this point, we don't have a lot of clarity on where exactly this mass production for sodium ion batteries will go, but we know that grid energy storage is a viable application. CATL has come out and said that these Naxtra batteries will be used in hybrid systems. And they also said there will be a version of this Naxtra battery that will replace traditional lead acid batteries. So when it comes to these Naxtra cells and passenger EVs, we don't have a lot of data other than what they said. It could allow up to 310 miles on a single charge. And at least from a supply standpoint, this would be a great thing for Tesla because Tesla is one of CATL's biggest customers. Maybe it's the skeptic in me, but important context here, this was CATL's investor tech day. So of course they wanna come out and share some flashy stats and breakthroughs to get everybody excited. Just think of this 
similar to Tesla's battery day. So we'll see if sodium ion can become anything more than a short range micro car for EVs throughout 2026. And we'll see if these charging speeds can be achieved in the real world. Remember, most of the charging infrastructure, even in China, isn't really built to deliver these speeds required to hit those figures. But I'm definitely rooting for CATL because any improvements will improve the cost to range ratio for EVs at a time when basically all markets outside of China could use a boost to get back to the growth rates like many were expecting just a year or two ago. And again, I think the most exciting storyline would be how the supply chain could open up if a sodium ion breakthrough really happened. It would likely take years for any US company to follow CATL's lead, but it would be confirmation that it's possible and other US startups would likely crop up, not having to navigate the lithium waters that run through China given the current trade tensions. And yeah, a sodium ion battery in a cyber cab would be awesome and theoretically makes a lot of sense. Tesla is in discussions with US chip maker Micron as well as CG Semi out of Mumbai to evaluate procurement options as it looks to diversify its global supply chain. And remember, last year Tesla made a deal with Tata Electronics to buy semiconductor chips. Tesla spoke to representatives from the three large semiconductor facilities that have taken off in India, Micron, CG Semi, and Tata Electronics. It called meetings about a month and a half ago to get a sense of what kind of chips are expected to be packaged, when they'll be ramping up, and the timelines for operations. They said there are strong indications that Tesla has started engaging suppliers beyond China and Taiwan with targets set as early as 2025. India is emerging as a serious contender in this shift. Tesla's reliance on Chinese fabs for mature node chips has been central to operations for Giga Shanghai, but growing geopolitical risks and rising costs are pushing Tesla to rethink its sourcing strategy. This, by the way, is from Economic Times India. They said Tesla is poised for double-digit compound annual growth rate in consumption of 28 to 65 nanometer node products. Just know this type of chip is usually referred to as automotive grade, so it's more middle-of-the-road technology not any sort of leading edge chips. But they said battery management system components performance and efficiency are pivotal to players like Tesla's competitive moat as it influences battery life and efficiency. Would it be promising for more companies to be vying for Tesla's business? Absolutely, but keep in mind India's chip sector still faces scale and ecosystem maturity hurdles despite strong government backing. On X, Elon said it was an honor to speak with PM Modi. I'm looking forward to visiting India later this year. And Modi said we discussed the immense potential for collaboration in the areas of technology and innovation. India remains committed to advancing our partnerships with the U.S. in these domains. And just in case you saw this post, I wanted to clarify this was old. They said Tesla will set up its manufacturing plant in Gujarat. Its announcement is likely to be made at the vibrant Gujarat Summit. It's rumored to be a future plant of the next-gen $25,000 compact EV for the Indian market. The problem with this is this was the rumor back in 2023, and then the vibrant Gujarat summit happened in 2024 and Elon didn't even attend. So this was old news and I'm sure you'll remember Elon saying publicly that Tesla was looking to invest in India as fast as humanly possible. But Elon made that quote in June 2023, if you can believe it. So that's pretty outdated at this point. Now, yes, there is absolutely something brewing with Tesla and India right now on multiple fronts. And eventually a plant in Gujarat may still happen, I'm just saying that's not a new news item. Dan Ives put out a new note on Tesla stock. I'm not going to get into it. I just wanted to share that the expectations for Tesla this year are coming down. So if there's a silver lining, it's that the bar is even lower. At this point, Wall Street has cut their 2025 delivery estimates down from about 2 million to roughly 1.65 to 1.7 million. And the earnings per share expectations are around $2. And when it comes to Tesla earnings tomorrow, sure, I'm expecting quite poor financials, but I am low-key excited to hear about this company update as Tesla has been calling it. But if you like to know where the bar is at, Wall Street is expecting around 44 cents in EPS. When it comes to auto gross margin X credits, the Wall Street number is 12.3%. And first quarter revenues are right around $21.4 billion. And you guys already know what I'm going to say. If there was so much noise,
noise in the delivery numbers for quarter one, there's going to be the same amount of noise with Tesla's financials. Of course, to some degree, it'll depend on how Tesla chooses to handle things from an accounting perspective. But for me, this is definitely not going to be a clean quarter, meaning it'll be tough to draw any conclusions going forward. Now, personally, I don't think clean quarters truly ever really exist, but this certainly would not be one. Sawyer received another really cool story. This guy's sister-in-law was diagnosed with Guillain-Barre syndrome, something that attacks your nerves. She struggled to manage her three kids and depends on family members to do the driving for the family. Recently, she tried the Model 3 with FSD for a few trips, which required zero interventions. Amazed, she bought one. Now, she independently drives her kids to school and attends therapy by herself. FSD has changed her life. Her mom asked her, are you driving? She replied, I no longer drive, just super. Supervise. And to think that there are literally people out there rooting for this technology to fail, hating it at every turn. At certain Tesla locations, they're now offering an introduction to FSD supervised workshop. They say, learn how our advanced driver assistance system enhances safety and convenience behind the wheel. Space is limited, RSVP now. And while we all know the Tesla delivery experience is head and shoulders above the rest of the industry, the actual handoff of the vehicle at Tesla Tesla locations could definitely be better. I've now picked up two Teslas and somebody like me, I don't need any walkthrough of the vehicle, but the problem is they treat everybody like they treat me. Tech Geek Tesla recently shared a story about her mom's experience on delivery day. The Tesla sales staff wouldn't even go out to the car with her and she was disappointed because she felt like she was alone. She asked if somebody could help show her the car and the staff didn't shoot her straight, just saying she could go out and look at it by herself. So for her, overall, it was a terrible delivery experience. And listen, to drive this point home, I just finally took my new Model 3 Performance to the shop to get it inspected. The gentleman that was working there said he didn't know how to open the doors, he didn't know how to put it in drive, he basically didn't know how to operate the vehicle, and he had to ask one of his co-workers how to do it. So what I'm saying here, for a lot of people, there's still a lot of foreign technology in these vehicles. Back to Tech Geek Tesla's story, this one had a happy ending. Multiple employees reached out to a apologize, Tesla's going to change their mobile and web interfaces in the next two to three weeks. He said delivery will be even better for first time EV and Tesla owners. On FSD, Amy Sober shared her experience with her family. She said, I've never seen FSD do a maneuver like this before. It was amazing. It saved our lives. I highly recommend purchasing this feature. You might need it someday. FSD is worth every penny. And one more, Eric shared, went and helped my mom pick up her new Tesla today. She loves it. It drove her all the way home on FSD, about an hour drive. She would have never done that in her old vehicle. She feels she has so much more freedom now. We went from being a no Tesla family to having two of them in less than two months. Just so you know, I'm not glossing over it. There was a report over the weekend that Tesla was going to delay the US launch of a more affordable EV. The problem is the source is Reuters. So for me, let's just wait to see what Tesla has to say on the call tomorrow. For what it's worth, the article said the delayed timeline offered a range of revised targets from the third quarter to early next year. The reason for the delay was not clear. Frito-Lay is building a new semi-charger at their production plant in Bakersfield. Permits were filed as of the last week for the installation of eight Tesla semi-chargers. Monroe Live did an interview with Bon Eggleston, the senior director of Tesla's 4680s. Bon did say Tesla is using simultaneous dual side coating for both the anode and the cathode, but he could not disclose the exact speed, but he said it was competitive with wet coating speeds. On the electrolyte front, Bon said Tesla uses its own custom formulations and does work with major suppliers. Tesla is working on recovering materials from the manufacturing line for reuse, aiming to short circuit the recycling loop. And on that point, Tesla manages the reuse of materials from unplanned and planned scrap, which is easier with the dry battery electrode process. Tesla does actually have a stamping line for making the cell cans and is looking at insourcing some other components. Doing it this way means Tesla just ships the steel coils and then manufactures the cans in-house, which reduces wasted space, it's better for contamination, and there are fewer process steps. He said, 
laser technology has advanced, making the welding process more feasible, and the throughput per production line for 4680 cells is much higher than other cylindrical cells because the cell is bigger. Tesla is looking at future battery developments, but Bond didn't want to give anything away on this front. He said, despite media reports, Tesla is comfortable with where the 4680 product is at. Bond said he could not disclose the exact headcount at the Texas facility, but they measure performance by headcount per gigawatt hour. He did, however, say cell manufacturing must be fully automated. So basically, people are only there to fix problems with the machines, not tend to the cells. And perhaps most importantly, he said there are significant improvements in range, fast charging, and safety still to come. Joe Tetmeyer had a nice find today at Giga Texas with several new kinds of castings that do not look like they're for the Model Y or the Cybertruck. Some were sharing this image. If you zoom in, you can see RTTX 050. Some are assuming that means Robotaxi Texas. There's also RSF, which could mean rear subframe. It's all just speculation for now though. So whether it's the Cybercab or a more affordable variant, Tesla is clearly working on what's next. And as you can see, there seems to be quite a few of them. It's not just a handful. But because I know everybody loves when I speculate, if I had to say, I would guess these are for the Cybercab, and it would make sense as we're expecting prototype production throughout this summer. The screens look amazing, especially from Skyfox, and it is not just for Tesla. Any electric vehicle can charge in there, and I'll go a step further. You, without an electric vehicle, can go in there, eat, and actually watch a movie where they're going to be playing movies there, apparently. Uh, they've got, they're talking about the, uh, the wait staff on roller skates. I don't know if they're going to be able to pull that off. If that happens, it's going to be amazing. Even the cherry blossoms are blossoming right now. This would be the time to open that uh, restaurant up. Remember that small community in Houston that was new construction with Tesla solar roof and power wall? Well, those properties are attracting interest from far beyond state lines. A Houston-based broker has said the homes have been flying off the market. The broker said, we've honestly had no issues with Trump and Elon backlash. In fact, I had over 150 plus people at my broker open. It was insane. People were very excited. Houston is an oil and gas place, so having the first Tesla-powered homes is unheard of. They said the buyers are normal, everyday people. Some have even come from different countries to get their hands on these homes. The best line of all, though, interest in the Tesla-powered properties has been so impressive, the broker believes the homes will become the new standard for Texas. Tesla stock closed the day at $227.50, down 5.75%, while the the NDX was down 2.46%. The Tesla volume was 30% below the average. Remember, no video from me tomorrow for earnings day. Hope you guys can enjoy the day no matter how the results come in. And as always, we'll just focus on seeing the bigger picture and hoping to get some exciting updates about the company. Hope you guys have a wonderful day. Please like the video. If you did, you can find me on X links below. And a huge thank you to all of my Patreon supporters.